before we started our very interesting digression on paradigm, uh, I think we were uh, just trying to see how uh, the illocutionary act, the commandment, the oath, etc., grounds the semantic relation itself. So the, the link between words and things is grounded grounds on this act of language, this institutional uh, act like uh, commandment and oath, as if here the original commandment is the, the one addressed to the word so that they refer to things. <coughs> because I hope to see you are, it's uh, evident for you that no one never <laughs> that no one never could really understood how his that word refer to things. It's really uh, huge problem <coughs> that of course cannot be explained by the naive theory that men agreed to use this for this because how could they agree if they don't, didn't have the language so so it's a it's not an evident problem at all how <coughs> does a word refer to the thing it's a kind of a huge problem. And here we see that um, in some way it is an act <coughs> of commandment, an act of commandment or an oath who tries to establish and fix this uh, relationship. And we could in this perspective see in a new light uh, this concept we try to speak about uh, yesterday of the zero degree. Zero degree. You remember, for instance, uh, David Strauss' conception that uh, a zero degree signifier is a signifier <coughs> without any signified, an exceeding signifier to which no signification or signified corresponds. And perhaps this uh, notion of a zero degree covers um, what we're trying to understand. Uh, the zero degree perhaps covers this uh, aspect of commandment in, in implicit in language. Because if we ask now, but how can we conceive <coughs> a, sig a zero signifier, uh, a signifier which uh, without a signified. A signifier without a signifier is not a sign, is an act, is an action. So the zero degree is a way to keep, to maintain the signification even where there is no more signification. With this idea of a zero signifier, we still believe that there is a signifier without <coughs> signification. What, what is a signifier without signification? Is still a sign or is something else? An act. Like we remember when uh, the discussion between Benjamin and Sholem, Sholem said in Kafka novels we have a zero degree of Torah, zero degree of revelation. The revelation in its null point. <laughs> but then uh, Kafka, uh, Benjamin objected, no, it, a revelation, a writing, which you cannot understand, no meaning, is no more a writing, it is life. In the same way we could say a signifier without signified, it's not a sign, it's an act, it's an action. We could say, we'll speak about this, it's a gesture. And 
then so in some way <coughs> these uh, uh, zero degree theories that we examined in the uh, Dali construction uh, the linguist's conception of a zero degree yes? um, when, you, when you say Derrida um, we've, spoke, we've spoken in another seminar about hospitality um, and Derrida's conception of hospitality uh, um, inviting someone in without it asking any questions as a gesture but it seems to me that that's also a naming or a kind of a reconstructing, a renaming. Um, so there is a semantic, linguistic element to it. So we can speak about this as the zero degree signifier, but there's also always this kind of second level aspect involved. <coughs> I don't know. Yeah, in some way we, we could see that uh, Derrida deconstruction implies always this dimension of a, a zero signification. There is signification. You're right. There is, but without content. Without, um, of course, the main point uh, for the construction, signification must be this, even it's in its uh, zero degree form. <coughs> then we could say that uh, this uh, uh, paradigm of the zero degree signification covers the phenomenon we are trying to understand here. This fact that here we have something exceeding signification, which is no more signification, which is a, an act, which is a commandment, which is a gesture, we have something else. If we keep the paradigm of signification at that stage, we lose the perception of the difference that is implied in between. So I think that, that so the zero degree theory, uh, <coughs> of course, was a uh, very useful in human science in the 20th century, it permitted the constitution of many uh, disciplines, especially in the linguistics domain. But then also it covered the possibility of seeing that uh, there there is something else. There is a command, there is an act, there is something which is not of the order of signification. The, the, what I approach to this theory is that they understand that signification as never ending. There is no limit to signification. There always will be signification. You will have signs even where no signs, no signified is there. So it's a, it's kind of a, a primacy <coughs> of the signification in the 20th century culture. You could say that the 20th century culture is under this paradigm of signification at any price. Signification must be there even where no, nothing is signified. But in that way, many political aspects, many this phenomenon, for instance, of uh, an heterogeneous phenomenon appearing in linguistics, appearing beyond signification, like the commandment we are trying to understand, is something which exceeds signification. Commandment is not a sign, it's not an act of signification. <coughs> And this could be perhaps the moment of speaking of a very interesting problem, which is the problem of gesture. Because, as you know, a commandment can some take the form of a gesture. The gesture of command. The gesture is a very interesting phenomenon. Eh? We have a very few investigations in the very interesting field. But for instance, we have some investigation on uh, the gesture <coughs> that accompanies a language. You know, uh, I'm gesticulating while speaking. So this kind of gesture, uh, called by the German scholars, rede gestus, uh, gesture of language, of speaking. And uh, so we have some interesting investigation on uh, this gesture, which uh, accompany the act of speaking. Uh, in our perspective, it would be interesting to understand, are they 
uh, emphasizing the illocutionary aspect of language, probably, you know, the kind of gesture, are an illocutionary element. Uh, when I make the gesture, I am uh, uh, trying to displace language <coughs> and discourse on, uh, on a plan of uh, act as an action and translating into an action my, my speech and this is probably on this on this side it's kind of an illocution, illocutionary non-linguistic element but which always accompanies language and then uh, again the very interesting works on this uh, you know that uh, Neapolitan peoples are famous for their power of gesticulating. So we have a very beautiful book written by a strange, a curious, uh, not really a scholar, but a kind of a strange man in the uh, 18th century. Uh, his name was De Iorio, and he wrote a book on the gesticulation of Neapolitans as a key to understand the gesture of the ancients. Why the gist of the ancient? Because we are statues. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek and Roman statues always have uh, gesture. We have also some paintings with gesture. And he had the idea that uh, through the gesticulation of the Spartan people, we could understand the meaning of this gesture. So it's, uh, it's not bad. It's an interesting book. And it's now very fashionable between anthropologists. <coughs> What's the author's name? The name is... <coughs> Theater is something as the gesture of ancient interpreted through the gesture of an important people, something like that in Italian. It is translated in English. <coughs> so then we also know eh, through the uh, rhetoric treaties of uh, Latin and Greeks that a Greek or Latin Roman oracle had to use gesture. And the ability to use gesture was part of the art of speech. So we have description of this gesture, which are really cases of so the gesture of speaking, and we know we have many instances of this gesture. And then we have also representation. So we have uh, <coughs> uh, images uh, which represent an orator by speaking. Then we have and then, so, first problem, what is the status of this uh, curious uh, language gesture, which accompany language, accompany It would be interesting to understand, do they work uh, emphasizing or underlining the non-apophantic aspect of language? Could be, could be like this, but you know, this is also an interesting field. Why do we make gesture while we speak? And, and probably, if we were, probably for instance, we could imagine <coughs> that uh, uh, an absolutely serious scientist would make no gesture because it is only in the cognitive and apophantic plane. So if you make a gesture, you exceed this plane. But on the contrary, continuously people make gesture. And the, my wife is a neuroscientist and a teacher when she makes presentations to not to make still, because people don't want to see you <laughs> doing this. They won't take you seriously, she says. Okay. So, yeah, it has been, there, there were some correlations found between doing this um, and uh, uh, exercising in real time. Parts exercising? Of exercising, literally uh, having a, a, a physical impact on, on uh, parts of your brain that are being connected. So you do this also to help yourself. Uh, yeah, it can have many causes, many causes. But then I just uh, just uh, ask the question: How can we <coughs> understand them in relation of ours? Yeah. Which part they are situated? 
which part they can feed. But then we have also, on the contrary, we know also, uh, from also the, the documents, um, ancient documents, that there, were, there existed gesture of commandment. Precisely gesture of commandment. We have representation of the Roman emperor make a gesture of commandment which is often the right arm raised with the end raised like that. It is the one the fascists took. This was uh, meant as a gesture of commandment and we had even comment commentaries by uh, ancient historians, uh, for instance, say the emperor making this gesture stop <coughs> the barbarian armies. It was a gesture, an efficacious gesture of commandment. So these uh, are not very uh, interesting for us because they are, they are a commandment which instead of taking the form of uh, a linguistic form, takes another form which is, was parallel to the other because uh, the putting together gesture and language is part of the rhetoric tradition of the Western culture. There you have a gesture which uh, stay, autonomizes itself and stays alone as gesture of commandment. Then we have also other similar, it's a very curious thing, that from this gesture of commandment and from the gesture also of the rhetorician, which were similar, because sometimes the, the rhetorician has had to raise the arm, the arm and uh, staying for instance <coughs> like this, like that, etc. And then we have also the interim fact that this gesture was uh, retaken and uh, articulated in a different way in the Christian gesture of benediction. You see benediction? Mm -hmm. so, so the Christ is often represented in the gesture of what is called Latin benediction. And we have two forms. Now I forgot exactly. One is like this. The other is a different way of putting the fingers. But it is a gesture of benediction, which is a, a huge importance in, uh, not only in the representation of the Christ, but then after in the liturgy. Because then the Pope will repeat his gesture of benediction, and the Bishop will repeat his gesture of benediction, etc. Mind the term benediction. <coughs> contains the verb dicere, diction, means uh, telling uh, the word, saying the word. And the contrary is the curse is a malediction, <coughs> saying the evil. <coughs> saying the evil. It's, a, it's an interesting fact that, uh, for instance, we didn't mention this, that uh, the, in the formula of the ancient oath, often the formula was contained a malediction. So there is, a, I swear this and this, but then there was a curse, a malediction, saying, if I do not do this, my sons will be killed, my house will be destroyed, and that everyone, so kind of a curse, a company, <coughs> the old. And we did not speak about this. <coughs> of course, the curse and the benediction are non-apophantic form of laws. Of course, the curse cannot be true or false and the benediction cannot be true or false. So it's another instance for, of non-apophantic laws. And another example we did not mention is the <coughs> blasphemy. You say blasphemy? Mm -hmm. blasphemy? Blasphemy is not true or false. Uh, I am not familiar with the English blasphemy, which would be a very normal form of English blasphemy. I know the French, the Italian, there are a lot of them, there are thousands of uh, forms of blasphemy. How would be a, a current? No, no, Godden? Yeah. Godden. 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 
Or Jesus Christ, because uh, ah, pay attention. <laughs> the the blasphemy in the beginning must is not accompanied like God damned damned God. No, the, the blasphemy in the beginning is just the pronunciation of the name of God in vain. You no, know, because the oath contained the name of the God, but this was legitimate. The God was called as witness. But if you take the name of God from the old, you take a part from it, you have a blasphemy. And uh, the, what in the commandments is, do not use the name of God in vain. So the blasphemy had the form of just, Jesus Christ is a blasphemy. Jesus, no? English people. What another form of English blasphemy? You're not familiar, you never... Uh, <laughs> That's the decay of religion in, uh, okay. in the English world. In English, they say blood. Blood. But it means by the lady, meaning Mary. So, blood, which you often hear, ah, bla ah, bloody means by the lady. <laughs> the lady, the Virgin Mother. Bloody. So, I mean, uh, it's evident no, that this, uh, the curse uh, and the blasphemy are a form of non apophantic logos. We didn't uh, analyze them, but it would be interesting. And, uh, and also, the insult is a form of non apophantic logos. No? If you say you, as all, of course, uh, it's not uh, true, you are not an asshole. <laughs> or, I don't know, the insult, by definition, cannot be uh, considered as a true or false because otherwise it will be not a fact. If someone uh, say, tells me, insults me, and I <coughs> consider it as an apophantic logos, I'm not offended because I just say, no sir, you are mistaken. I'm not <laughs> but on the contrary, uh, uh, no, no, that's important because it's, uh, it's not uh, evident that the insult is not a, a judgment. When I insult a man, I'm not saying you belong to the category S O or you belong <laughs> to the category P or whatever. I don't know what insult. Uh, because if you read like that, it's not an insult, it's just a, a statement, but it is a false statement. Thank you. But the, the, the semantic of insult is uh, non apophatic So just to see how big is the, the, the field of the non apophatic But let's, uh, let's speak uh, a moment on the, still on the concept of gesture. Because also we saw this gesture, commandment gesture, gesture which accompany this course. But let's try to, and when we go back to something we saw with the example, and also when you made the, the you mentioned the mimicry. So let's try to understand what uh, a pure gesture could be. I take this term, pure gesture, from Benjamin, who speaks of, uh, uh, in a different context, of a Rhine metal, of a pure medium. So, what is uh, what would key, what we, could we define as being a really a pure gesture? So, if I make I move my arm, my hand in order to take this uh, glass in order to drink, we can call this a gesture, but it's <coughs> that's not exact. This is just a movement of my hands from. Uh, this, I'm displacing my hand from this point to the other in order to do a thing. So there is a clear end. But what would it be? A pure gesture. So now think to a mime. You say mime? Mm -hmm. Making this same gesture. Same gesture I've done now, made by a mime. So <coughs> no glass, of course, no drinking, no water. What happens when a mind makes a gesture? Could you try to define this, what happens here? So, 
the first example is clear. I move my hand, and my hand, and I want to drink. So there is a clear hand, and I drink, I take the glass and drink. But when a mind makes the same gesture or another gesture, what is he doing? He is he's doing the same gesture in some way, but deprived to, from any connection to the end. But I say this, it's deprived of any connection. Is this true? Now, in some way, he is repeating the gesture of drinking. What happens here is that uh, the gesture is uh, shown in its, uh, uh, as being a, a medium, a mean <coughs> the end of uh, drinking, but deprived of the, its connection to the end. So it is, as we said, that the example shows, uh, when I make an example, the singularity shows its belonging to the set. In the same way, in the gesture of the mind, the movement of, the, of my hand is shown in its nature of being a mean towards a name, but without, but the, now the relationship to, to the end is cut. And so we perceive, we can say, what the mind shows is the gesture, the pure gesture in itself. But it's still the same gesture, it's not another gesture. It's the same gesture of drinking, shown as a mean <coughs> to the act of drinking, but Freed to from the relation to the end. Yes. But could we say that the act of illustration is the end? The act of illustration, because the mind engages in mimesis, which is imitation or illustration. So, is the end result the actual illustration, the process of illustrating the gesture? Could that be the actual goal? Yeah, you, you are, you are uh, uh, trying to uh, restate the absence of an end <coughs> as being the end. I don't think that that. So the, the, the end of the mind is not so simple as uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm making the gesture of drinking. No, it would be not interesting. It's, it, it, it shows the gesture in its pure nature of uh, gesture, no? without the connection to an end, but without establishing a new connection. These are aesthetical perception that makes us think uh, also that the end now is just illustrating. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's true. It's, it's our aesthetic uh, perspective that uh, makes us uh, assign a new end. There is no end. What it's shown is uh, uh, the gesture as not using uh, Bedian's word, as reine meter, as pure means, without an end. But it's not another thing. So it's not that uh, uh, it is still, I mean, he's still making the gesture of drinking. And you recognize it as such. You recognize that it is the gesture of drinking. So it is still a mean toward an end. But freed by the relation to a mean. So shown as such. <coughs> Is, is the relation then to the of the example, the, the singularity? Yeah, I, I, when I, I got this idea when you were speaking of the example and uh, spoke of the mimic cry. Because the, also the example shows it's uh, belonging to something, but in this, but not uh, in the same way it, it, it's uh, extracted from the, this relation. So in some way the gesture of the mime shows the, the gesture of drinking but freed from the relation to but we really perceive we could see now for the first <coughs> time I see what is the gesture of drinking mm. because uh, in, in the normal gesture of drinking you don't see the gesture you, 
so the, the, the gesture as a pure mean gets forgotten in the usual gesture. So it's no more. That's why I say the real gesture is the one of the mind, not the one I'm doing. But this is true for, for a huge lot of uh, dance, I mean, can be understood in that perspective. What would a good definition of dance could be? Uh, dance shows the movements of the bodies as pure means, as pure gesture. But you had just a, yes. But not necessarily in relation to a... No, uh, and at the mime, there is a relation to a man. Uh, but then, there you have uh, the, the possibility of movements of a human body shown with no relation to a man. The dancer will show the movement of the body, but again, as such, free to, of any relation to <coughs> this particular. So the dancer does not move in order to go <coughs> from the point A to the point B because there is something, there is a certain reason. There is no reason to move from one uh, point to the other. But in that way, uh, the human body is, uh, the possibility of movement is human body is shown as such. But there is nothing uh, transcendent, there is nothing, there is not another dimension. It's just the dimension of the possibility of movements of the human body. It's exactly like in the mind, there is nothing, uh, there is not another dimension. It is the same gesture of drinking which, i which is uh, shown as such, and not uh, the contest and the which it goes on. And this is, um, so I think it's a very important concept in uh, to better understand what is <coughs> called aesthetics, a word which I do not like at all, aesthetics. But I mean, all the domain of art has to do with this dimension of pure means, or gesture as such. Not as a in some way, we could pure even pure means. Pure means. Yeah. Why say pure means? Because it is still a means. Because it's a, he's making the same gesture, which is a mean toward the end, towards the end of drinking. But shown as something <coughs> free to the relation of the. So strangely, yes, it still means not another. It's not another dimension. It's not, it's, uh, because usually uh, aesthetic is uh, defined as the dimension of the end in itself, in itself, uh, as a pure end. No, it's, it's a, not a good concept. Uh, uh, the aesthetics is not uh, the dimension of the end in itself. It is a dimension of a pure me, without an end. And for instance, we could look to poetry also in this same uh, direction, same, the same perspective. Because what is a poem? A poem does not transcend the plane of language. A poem is something which is totally on the plane of language. It would be stupid to think that uh, poetry goes beyond. No, poetry stays on the level of language, the language we use. Eh? But then what happens is perhaps that for the first time language <coughs> is shown as such. Not used uh, to an end of communication, information. Uh, so what, the, what happens in the poem is that language and all these functions of communication, uh, information, etc., are disactivated. <coughs> are disactivated, and uh, language is shown as such, as pure means. I say pure means because there is not another. It's not that now I transfer language in the heaven. Not at all. It's still, it just stays in the, in the level of the it's, it's simply using language. But what you get is that. Uh, all these other functions, which usually we consider as fundamental, 
communication information, etc., etc., the normal semantic uh, content of language is uh, made inoperative so that language is shown as such and open to a new possible usage. And even when we have an extreme case, uh, for example, of mimologics, where you have mimologics, even where you have a bird, for example, that speaks, that <coughs> can give uh, a, a sentence in English or French or a kind of song. It, it is a kind of um, within a kind of paradigmatic set of relations. It appears as language. Its very appearance is as language without reciprocity, meaning that it cannot go back to a communication. Uh, it cannot even go back to, to the human because it is, after all, a bird. Nonetheless, even in that appearance, it is a mark for the purity of language, for the pure language, rather, even in such an extreme case. I never thought of this, but it's right. Eh? Hmm? I think the only problem is that in my life I had a very strange experience with the bird, which <laughs> really marked my uh, yeah? I'm difficult, but I go back to this. <laughs> so in Rome there was a restaurant where there was a, a, is a black Indian verse that called the uh, Gadurari Yus, I think. There's yeah. a verse who speaks perfectly. In English it's called Maina. Maina. Yes. So they speak really perfect. And not only speak, but they can uh, imitate uh, the calf or the or a dog. Uh, <laughs> but so this uh, bird was there at the entrance of the restaurant. But he always repeated the same thing. Ciao, come stai? Ciao, where are you? Ciao, come stai? So once, I, I used to go very often to this place. So once, uh, uh, just uh, getting out from the restaurant, he was there and told me, Ciao, come stai? And I said to him, Dici sempre le stesse, you repeat always the same thing. <laughs> And he told me, you too. You laugh, but for me it was that was a Can't imagine. As you told you can't imagine there is a That it is I was really struck. <laughs> then perhaps a possible explanation is that it was uh, he, he learned to, to, to say this and then if someone said something else perhaps someone <coughs> struck the into I don't know but it was really said because he just said you too <laughs> <laughs> but you know wherever, wherever it comes from when it returns like that it's absolutely terrifying because it is completely uncanny and terrifying and it, it's uh, like an echo. It, it comes back from where? What where is it? It's uncanny. But if you now go back to our idea of the poem, uh, this seems really to me a, a good definition of what happens in a poem. It stays on the level of the language. It does not transcend it. But in disactivating you know, all this uh, information, I think, the usual uh, function of, of language. Yeah, we can say it shows language as such, freed from any other function, and this opens the possibility of a new usage that can be called the poem. We call this poem, poetry. It's not a useless. <laughs> it's, uh, yes? You earlier had talked about the naked semantic core of the verb and the <coughs> yes, the idea. And I'm wondering if there's a relationship with gesture, and as you described the gesture of the mind as being a kind of naked semantic core. Yeah, pr probably you're right, because uh, I mentioned this because it was uh, this uh, uh, Benveniste uh, definition of uh, the imperative, very quick definition, very contradictory. He said, uh, you in, in the imperative, you have the naked semantic core but with, with no denotation. Mm -hmm. So in this way it could be, yes, you have the language as such without any reference to, 
communicative or informational or even semantic. But he, but he said semantic core, strange, like contradictory. No? Yeah, but in the way that the poem continues to mean, it's not meaningless. <coughs> but in some way, uh, it achieves to show itself, language itself, as such. No? This is, makes a it's kind of surprising thing. So when you read a good poem, there is a moment of surprise because you perceive language as such, not uh, described in all the uh, informational function, etc. And this, I mean, it's, a, it's also a new possibility of usage. Because when you, that's why I say that the mind, it is it's repeating the same gesture. But, but it's something new. It's also something new. Not transcendent, it stays on the same level, but it's something new, it's a new usage of gesture, mm -hmm. which shows gesture as such, and the dancer also bears for it. And, uh, and perhaps you could uh, uh, extend this to painting, I don't know, but with image, you know, uh, uh, as if the painting shows the vision, for the first time, the vision as such. You always are looking at things, you're looking at things, you're, looking at things, you're accustomed to look at, to see things. But perhaps now, look at that. Now the painter shows something, look at that, eh? and you discover the vision, so you discover vision as such, perhaps. I don't know. Just to talk about the, the art function, maybe in front of the viewer, the art critic Boris Gray says, we need critics of art critics of choice. Or a script. Yeah, know. he says that uh, we need criticism as a textual bikini to cover the nakedness of art between <laughs> ourselves and the art. Re repeat it. So we need yeah. criticism as a kind of textual bikini to cover the nakedness <laughs> of the encounter with art. So he says we need that sort of mediating. Uh, process in order to experience art, otherwise it's too naked. Yeah. <laughs> there is also a definition uh, made by a strange guy, a kind of artist, that I always uh, quote it and it says, um, um, art is uh, a way to make life more interesting than art. <laughs> it's Robert yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Interesting, interesting guy. Also, also said another nice thing. Said that uh, a bird is a bird, a bourgeois is a bourgeois, a bird eaten by a bourgeois is a meal, a bourgeois eaten by a bird is a miracle. I always forget its name. Yes. I have just one small reference on the language that Thomas was using of the terrifying, of the horrifying encounter in relation to the mimetic arts. I mean, I think that this is the exact, the perfect entree to return back to the precise language that Plato uses in the Greek for justification. Uh, of the notion of banishing the mimetic arts from the polis, and that is because of its potentiality to inspire uh, a teos phobos, a divine fear, a divine awe, which is the awe of seeing the artifice with which the art is exposing in the encounter with a, a pure means. Um, so just the, on the textual level, it's precisely the terror yeah, when confronted with this, you can feel uh, terror, you can feel uh, joy, you can feel uh, astonished, amazed, but you have a reaction. Right? If, if, if it really works, if it really shows language as such, shows gesture as such, you're struck. It's impossible not to be struck because uh, it uh, frees what, what you, you do in every day we speak, every day we speak, every day we move. But then for the first time we perceive uh, language and movement <coughs> as such. Which is to perceive that it is possible to do this otherwise. I mean, this is why it's threatening to the polis. Yeah, and, and yeah, also 
that's why it opens up to a new usage. It's important because it's not gratuitous. The, the, the showing language as such means also to make a new usage possible. No, so it's, it's, a, it's not simply negative, just showing, uh, it's not just showing language as such, but doing this uh, makes possible another usage of a language. I just say, ah, so I could use language in that way. <coughs> and then invent even a new way, you know? so the, po the poet is not repeating the same thing. Okay, why we came to this? Uh, and then, then <laughs> no, no, again, this, uh, no, why, why I mentioned this uh, also? It has to do with our subject. Because this notion of, of uh, Rhine Mittel, pure me, is, in my opinion, beyond the opposition of apophantic and non apophantic forms. It seems to be on the side of the non apophantic, because it's kind of an action that you make. Make on, you act on language, you, make, you act on uh, gesture. But what you have, in my, in my opinion, is beyond the oppo this opposition, this machine, double machine, uh, commandment, apophantic uh, uh, logos, etc. No? So the two, we have, a, we have a kind of third in this uh, dimension of uh, pure means. And you cannot say uh, this is uh, simply a uh, speech act. It's more than that. The, the art is not, the poet is not making simply a speech act. <coughs> and, and, and it's not simply uh, locutionary, <coughs> because it's not the semantic uh, which is uh, important. So it seems to me that uh, it could be uh, a third that we could. Uh, point as being a possibility of thinking in another way than the linguistic machine and another way to disactivate both aspects, <coughs> both the apophantic and the non-apophantic and opening a new, a new perspective, which can be, we can call uh, pure means, just to use Benjamin. By the way, Benjamin speaks of uh, this uh, notion of Rhine Mittel, pure mit means, in the political dimension. <coughs> it is in his uh, beautiful essay on violence. In 1921, he wrote a very beautiful essay on violence, and there he develops this idea of a political <coughs> action conceived as pure means, without a man. Freed from the mean, but uh, uh, emancipated from the relation to. Uh, so he, he employs this uh, dimension in uh, this concept in politics, but we can, I think, generalize and make it of it a kind of uh, uh, both aesthetical, logical, etc. concept to understand language, art, etc. So this is not at all a conclusion, just a, a provisional stop. <coughs> Open a different perspective. It's, we are not doomed to apophantic, to the alternative between apophantic and non apophantic. There is perhaps a third.
especially in the European University, is meant that ah, you must learn something to a certain end, and then you have to work <coughs> to this, and then you must learn it. But you are completely <coughs> right. This uh, could uh, employ uh, this beautiful concept of study. What does it mean to study? Study must be conceived as having nothing to do, as you said, with no end. And that's why the, the condition of student was interesting, because the student, uh, the, 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 stu the moment of uh, life, uh, there is a very beautiful essay that they have called uh, The Life of the Student, in which he develops this idea that the moment of uh, the study, the life of the man, is a very beautiful moment precisely because it is uh, free from any relation to other <coughs> goals, economical, families, etc. And then we have also, you know that in, in Hebrew, study, the, term, the Hebrew term for study is Talmud. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the history of Judaism. So what happened in a certain moment of the history of Judaism was that, as you know, the temple was destroyed. Then for the, the second time, it was destroyed forever. It has never been built again. Then what happened in Judaism that uh, uh, what uh, was uh, in the beginning the function of the priest who was linked to the temple was uh, slowly, progressively, substituted by the Talmud. So the Torah was no more applied. So the Torah prescript, uh, so for instance, uh, the sacrifice must have this form, so the priest was the one who knew the Torah and then made the right gesture, uh, killed the animal in the right way, etc., etc. Now, the Torah was no more applied, but studied. And so we have this very beautiful figure in Judaism, which is the figure of uh, the scholar, the pure scholar, the, the one who studies the Talmud. Studies, <coughs> Talmud means studies. And uh, so you study the law and you don't apply it anymore. So you have this uh, huge sky. The Talmud is also the title, as you know, of the huge uh, collection of uh, text of interpretation that rabbis make about the Torah. So, but uh, the synagogue took the place of the temple, and in the, the rabbi became a, something was studying the law, and no more applying it. This very interesting uh, character of Judaism. But, and what happened is, when you study the law, the Torah, but you not apply it anymore, you just study. Again, you are giving back this, you are freeing this from an end, from relation to an end. I just study it. And this became a new value. So, so it's a very interesting conception of this study. You have no more to really make the sacrifice. Now you just study how they work uh, should be done. So that's a, perhaps it's one of the kind of uh, Judaism that I like uh, the best. It's a very interesting idea. To, we are no more applying the law, we are just studying, studying it. And of course, there are some other tendencies in Judaism which go in the opposite direction. And this idea of the, the fundamental character of the style. It is one thing that got lost in the uh, university, I don't know in the United States, but in the European University, this uh, importance of the study as such was lost. And the study must be connected to precise end. And that's a, it's a more study, it's a pure, stupid. We lost it in the US. Pardon? We lost it in the US. Also, yeah. Not at all. In some part. But precisely, 
university in the beginning was precisely the contrary, you know. And uh, in many countries, for instance, uh, even when you have finished your study in university, if then you want to make a profession, you have to do a special other examination with the representative of the law, for instance, to become a lawyer. In Italy, after you, stu you study law, but then if you want to make a profession, you have to do another examination with the, the orders of the lawyers, etc. Just to underline the fact that the study is separated from the profession. But now, on the contrary, there is no more study. There is just uh, <coughs> learning something, a tool for the an instrumental, uh, an instrumental conception of study. Do you know also of um, Edward Said's speech, Representations of the Intellectual? It's very nice because he advocates for reviving the term amateur as a way to love, using love um, to direct your studies, which connects back to Latin, because studio, I believe, means to be eager for. So it's a desire related to study rather than a kind of instrumentalization or a authorization, but a kind of desire or love as the basis <coughs> of a way to pursue knowledge. Mm. This is the right uh, way to conceive uh, Otherwise, it's not really interesting. Mm. Yes. I'm curious, and I don't know if we can do anything with this, but sort of this opposition between language and communication, and thinking of communication sort of as maybe like the the mathematical properties of possibly getting a signifier from one place to another, and what sort of the zero degree of communication looks like, and, and perhaps maybe it's a, a way to think through technology that they haven't really gone too far down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you mean? What's the question? Um, I was just thinking of this, like, this, the difference between language and communication, and if, in a way, Perhaps communication is the sort of way of transmitting information is sort of maybe kind of on the, the SD side of our ontological division ways. I mean, I know we suggested that language was sort of between the two, but maybe since language is, like we were saying, founded on command, maybe it's more on the ESTO side, whereas communication is sort of pure information transmission. Um, and maybe that I kind of think of it doesn't happen so much anymore, but you used to sometimes dial the wrong number and get a fax machine, and you just hear all these these beeps, and and perhaps that's kind of you know, just a, a metaphor for pure communication. <coughs> communication that does not work. Right, that, that doesn't work, but it still it's it's kind of it makes you aware of the, the process because it's communication without. There is also sorry, always I often mention. Was written by a friend of Benjamin, whose name was a uh, zone rate. This guy lived in Naples in the 20s, 20th century. And he observed the way in which the Puritans people used the technological apparatus. And he noticed a strange thing that they always used this uh, technological apparatus in the moment in which they do not function properly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, uh, so they insert something, they put even, <laughs> and for instance, in some way, they even completely use a technological apparatus for a completely different end. For instance, it shows that a certain, he saw, he saw, he saw, he saw in the street a man using the motor of its little uh, scooter, <coughs> not really a scooter, a cycle with a little motor. So it was using this motor in order to make the cream. <laughs> 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 not to make the cream in order that they became the chantilly. Yes. Mm. And he was astonished to see how he <laughs> did it. And uh, he, say, he said, this is a more intelligent, uh, more proper way of using technology instead of using uh, the technology only in the proper way. You know? 
it's, 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 here you see a way of opening the technology to a different usage. Well, if you just uh, you are under the commandment of the technological apparatus, you have just will do this gesture, and you think that you are commanding, but you are just applying the commandment that, that is inscribed in the apparatus. Uh, this conception of uh, the commandment, uh, would it be fair to say um, some function in public and are obvious and transparent and other ones function under the surface? And I'm, I'm giving an example like uh, Foucault's lectures on biopolitics where he's talking about the advance of neoliberalism as this slow, creeping conception and not necessarily overt and obvious but functions as a kind of commandment. Mm -hmm. What's the question? The, the question is, do, do some of these work uh, obviously <laughs> and transparently in a public way, and other ones function under the surface, mm -hmm. All right. without necessarily a, a knowledge, uh, a public knowledge of them? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's like that. I would like to kind of disagree kindly with you about communication and language. Because I think there's a really interesting connection here, and I don't know, I think, I suspect there's something with commandment as well. But um, there's more at work in communication and common and community than I think we recognize. There's a form of communication that makes possible the common upon which community can be built. And language doesn't necessarily do that. The communication in itself doesn't necessarily do that. And education doesn't necessarily do that either. You know, but there's a way, in English, we're language for, for education because there's these two. There's educare and then there's educare. And one means to like fill up a vessel, basically. The other one means to cultivate something up. And this kind this <coughs> of, of communication, I think, uh, allows for a much more... Um, the opportunity for a flourishing community in a way that language understood strictly in the sense of um, just grammar might not. But uh, I, I also agree that communication without this sense of cultivation and uh, reciprocity, to get back to this term earlier, it wouldn't be possible either. Now, I don't know how commandment and community and common and so on, they all seem to share in this group. But, uh, uh, first, what you said is true because now we, when we say according to the or so the language is not communicative, so then we are using a communication in a peculiar way, referring to a theory that, uh, that means that the language will transmit a certain content from man to another, so information. Of course, uh, the, the term communication contains the common, which is on the contrary the most fundamental thing, and. Uh, in some way, <coughs> remember in Heraclitus, Heraclitus, as you say in English, Heraclitus, Heraclitus, he says the logos is the koinos, is the common thing. Because then, if you go back to uh, when we saw to show language as such, why we can do this? Because this is the most common thing. So, so the community, of course, implies language. And not uh, in the communicational uh, uh, meaning, but in this other sense that the experience of logos is the most common thing to man. So, of course, commun so communication can have a good uh, meaning and uh, meaning. Uh, no, as far as the commandment, no, commandment does not come from common. Commandment man comes from the verb mandare, which means uh, to send mandate. So the commandment is something that you are mandating, you are sending. You are and uh, so, so when we go back to Heidegger's idea of the Shikungen, that uh, the history of being is the history of the historical, you could say commandments in the sea of the verb mandare. Mandate exists. <coughs> What does it mean to mandate? To mandate, it's, I think similar. It's like a synonym for command. It's a mandate or an edict. Okay, so you see, so it comes uh, the idea is the idea of a mandate. It brings us back.
it brings us back to uh, technology also, because uh, Ducrot, in the book of Svetan Turov, the uh, Dictionary on the Sciences of Language, is one of the few people to uh, represent uh, Jakobsen, who in 1955 writes an essay on the six aspects of internal communication. And the one aspect that, that is not taken up or analyzed or written about, uh, and in fact is only mentioned by, by the pro to his credit, this is the one place where it appears, is Jakobsen's emphasis on the phatic channel. The phatic channel. <coughs> and the phatic channel is that, that axis of communication where uh, there's a recursive reflection on the channel of communication itself. And so that is a question of technology, which is both uh, addressing. It's usually the fact that it has no content. No content at all. No, it's only about the, the conduit itself, yes? So the reflection on the conduit itself takes the question of technology and puts it in terms uh, of sort of making present or, or making visible. So it's not a matter of communication, but it sets itself into relationship with language in that way. Uh, so it brings us back to the question of technology. <laughs> No, 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 not, not, not uh, telling it, not, not, uh, it, it's the other book. Um, he, uh, it was a compilation he made with Svetan uh, Todoro, the Dictionary of Language, but it's just a, uh, a small treatment of Jakobsen and the Phatic Channel, which is, is something that, that we should still catch because it's an important recursion.